Welcome, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Entrepreneur Mind Speak. I'm Lauren with Creme de Mint, a branding and packaging design agency. And I'm here with my co host. Hi, my name is Natalie. I'm the founder of Cloud Create, and we do web design and development, specifically specializing in Shopify and e commerce. And today we would like to welcome Ryan Malkin, a seasoned expert in alcohol, beverage, and cannabis law. Today he'll be sharing with us valuable insights into compliance for alcohol startups. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for Thank being you. here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So let's first, um, let's talk a little bit, like tell, tell us a little bit about your background. I know I just gave an overview, but if you want to just tell us a little bit about your background and then we'll dive into some of the questions we have for you today. Sure. So I started in the alcohol beverage industry over 20 years ago, actually as a journalist. So I started writing in, in New York for publications about alcohol beverage, uh, doing product reviews and um, roundups. And then after I went to law school at night and after law school, I ended up going uh, after the prosecutor's office in Manhattan in-house at Pernod Ricard in New York. So I was in-house counsel for several years there and then moved to Miami about 10 years ago, which is when I started my practice. And we focus, um, as you mentioned, almost exclusively on the alcohol beverage industry and cannabis industries. Um, and we've been here, you know, ever since. And our 10-year anniversary was just a couple of weeks ago. So um, and we largely work with the, the brand side and the supplier side. Um, and the only other thing I would mention is that as with all discussions regarding things that might, you know, get into the legal aspects of things, it's for information and educational purposes only and is not intended to be specific legal advice or establish any attorney-client relationship. Well, uh, congratulations, Ryan. That is amazing. I was about to say the same. Congrats, 10 yeah. years. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So let's dive into some questions. Um, when an entrepreneur is just starting their alcohol brand or, well, we could also talk about cannabis, but let's start, first start with alcohol, with their alcohol brand. What are the first steps you recommend to make sure they start off on a strong legal footholding? So it's a little bit like an assembly line in some ways where you would typically form a company. You know, you can talk to tax counsel or tax accountant about whether or not an LLC or a corporation is better for, for you. But anyway, you would start the company. You would then typically apply for trademarks. You know, one of you guys perhaps would talk to them about the branding and the names, that sort of thing. Then you would make sure that the, the trademark is clear. So you would do a clearance search and the registration of the trademark. Um, with regards to trademark, the strongest trademarks are those that don't have any meaning in the real world until the brand brings the meaning to the real world. So um, you would typically want to make sure that, like, like, for instance, Google, right, didn't mean anything until Google brought the meaning. And mm -hmm. then after you have the branding and the, the brand name and the corporation form, you would then consider, well, how are you going to bring your product to market? Is that your own distillery or brewery? Is that more likely than not? co-packing with a, you know, somebody else who's already a distillery, winery, or brewery, and you're having them produce the product for you. What's your route to market? You know, how are you going to get the product to the store shelves? Um, and that sort of a thing. And so it's a little bit like a, a, a process where you're following one after the other until you see your product after the shelf. And if someone wants to research their state's legal requirements for alcohol businesses, where do you suggest that they start? And is there a reliable database? So there's a few different things you can do. For sure, you can go to your state alcohol beverage regulatory website, right? So like the New York would be the uh, SLA, the state liquor uh, authority. So Florida, you know, you would Google the same thing for, you know, Florida DABT, California ABC. So there are um, places where you can go. Our website has them. Um, you can also go to TTB. TTB.gov is a great resource for anybody who's starting and getting into the alcohol beverage industry. They have a huge amount of PowerPoints and um, free information. They also have links to, I believe they still do, every state's alcohol beverage control website. So it's pretty easy to get there. And then once you get to the state website, some states are better than others in terms of directing you, you know, where to go from there, right? So like, you know, you, you will find a link typically, like in California, there'll be a link to the ABC laws and you can pull up the whole thing and um, get access. And some states, again, are better than others in terms of being, you um, helpful in answering questions about starting a business in their state, what licenses you, you might need. But I would say overall, the states and the 
federal government are very happy to kind of help you understand what you need um, to get started. And certainly we can direct people to resources as well. Um, would someone ideally hire you as a legal representative at the beginning of their journey? Would that be the ideal time for someone to be able to get legal advice right at the start? Or is there a particular place in that lineup where you recommend people reach out to you? It's a great question. And there's a, a couple of answers. But by and large, I would say the sooner the better. Even if we tell you like, hey, you know, you're not ready to call us back in a month when you um, you know, know a little bit more about you want you what you want to do. It's always better to get ahead of the game. So just by way of example, we deal a lot with distribution agreements for clients with with brands. And sometimes they'll come to me and they'll say, Oh, we signed this distribution agreement, you know, a year ago, two years ago, whatever it might be. And now we want to terminate because the distributor is not doing well or we need to transfer. Um, you know, we're, we're working on a national deal with somebody else. And we hadn't reviewed it the first time around and we look at it and there's, you know, perhaps no way to get out or there's a very severe penalty to get out. Um, and so then you have to kind of negotiate to try to figure out a way to separate from that distributor. Whereas if we looked at it ahead of time, it would have perhaps taken only, you know, an hour or something to review the contract and put in place some things where, for instance, if the distributor is not doing a good job and didn't achieve certain goals, then we could terminate, you know, for cause. Whereas if you don't have that, well, it's a little bit more challenging to be like, you did a bad job and they say, well, we, we disagree and sort of now what? So I, I, I do think that it makes more sense to start talking earlier on, even if there's not that much to do, we can try to direct people and help people follow a more efficient path. So I, I think I'm all about efficiency and I think it's more efficient if we talk sooner than later. Definitely imagine people getting themselves into a lot of trouble accidentally before, especially if they're new to the industry and new to the laws and new to that kind of contract. Um, that would be really helpful to have your help on that. Pretty industry specific as well. You know, we oftentimes would say, oh, our, you know, cousin or something was a, some other lawyer and they reviewed it and um, they thought it was okay or, or, or whatever it might be. And it's a very, very industry specific um kind of negotiation, I would say. And the other part of it is that a lot of the distributor, like if you came to this contract and you were a lawyer from another industry, you may think the contracts are crazy, which, you know, you, you, they sort of are if you're not from this world. Um, they're oftentimes quite one-sided. And so you'll often see somebody trying to work with somebody who's not within the alcohol beverage industry. And there's a ton of red lines and, you know, kind of tearing the whole thing apart to make it more fair, which is not... Um, generally going to be accepted by most of the distributors because that's just not what the industry norm is within the alcohol industry. So it's one of those things where it does help, I think, and in the long run, save you probably time and money and headaches if you work with somebody um, that's familiar with the industry and these specific types of contracts and what industry standard is. And what is the industry, industry standard like for the cannabis industry? Is it similar to the alcohol industry? It's a, it's different. Um, in, I mean, well, certainly there's industry standards, but the distrib distribution contracts and things are like, like that are much different because the state laws are a little bit different. So no, those would oftentimes be a, a different type of agreement. There's certainly licensing deals. So for instance, um, we've helped brands where, let's just say by way of example, they're, you know, brand X is in California and now they want to sell brand X in Florida through the dispensaries obviously you can't just send the product from California to Florida like you could, uh, you know, an alcohol beverage product. So you're licensing the trademarks from, you know, that California brand that's doing really, really well to the um, producers in Florida. So um, we've dealt more with on that side of it, trying to get the people to have a consistent brand across the country as much as you, you know, you possibly can in, in this landscape. When business owners are developing their brand story and marketing materials, is there anything they should know about making claims or certain terminology that can get them into trouble in the alcohol industry and in the cannabis industry? Sure. So first of all, generally speaking, health claims are going to be prohibited. You're going to want to avoid misleading statements, right? So you're not going to want to say if you, you know, drink this or smoke this or, or whatever, you're going to um, you know, be more fun or be more social or 
you know, it's going to help you in some way with your health or really anything, right? Because obviously they're not necessarily intended to, you know, quote unquote, be good for you, right? So um, you want to avoid making any claims like that. Um, you also want to avoid misleading claims as well. So there have been some cases a few years ago where various brands were buying their product from big distilleries and then their claims on their labels suggested that they were producing them locally. And so there's been some litigation about that. So you want to make sure that you're not saying something that's not, you know, true. You can have romance or puffery language that talks about, you know, how great your product is, but you don't want to obviously lie uh, or mislead people. And then in terms of advertising and marketing on the alcohol side, you always have to have what they call a TTP advertising mandatory. And that's like, if you look at an ad, that little statement at the bottom, you'll often see it's like imported by so-and-so, you know, New York, New York or something. And so you have to have that statement and there's some specific rules around it, basically so that if there's an issue, the government knows who the responsible advertiser is. And there's similar rules uh, for social media as well. So, I mean, there's definitely rules for, for everything that alcohol industry is heavily regulated. And so you want to be mindful of the marketing and advertising and sales rules for, um, uh, for you know, for your product. Would you say that it is tricky um, since I work with a lot of e-commerce brands, so I'm always in the e-commerce world and I definitely run into certain areas and that can be states and it could also be products that are very difficult, even from an online store perspective, um, to make sure that you're really covering yourself um, and protecting yourself legally. So that can be like certain terms and conditions, various different things that people have to attest to as they're, um, you know, ordering something, especially when it comes to subscriptions and stuff like that, people can run into that. And I imagine that alcohol um, would have a similar kind of thing. Do you notice that people run into uh, having to really think through a lot of the terms and such and, and um, disclaimers and things like that that are on the site before they get something built? So there's a few pieces to what you said that we can work through. So first of all, yes, you would typically have terms and conditions and a privacy policy. Um, certainly if you're capturing people's information and you know asking people to register for your newsletter or whatever, you want to have your privacy policy and then terms and conditions as well that outline obviously some of the things that are going to be on your site. And one of those things might be, which is sort of getting back to what you first said, um, I think, is how people can, I'm going to, you know, sort of air quote, sell on their website as a brand, right? So domestic wineries can sell direct to consumer in most states in the U.S. and that's quite easy. And so in that case, um, you know, you could help them with their cart or something like that. And you check out and I'm in the winery. And so I take the money and I send it to you, right? So that's easy enough. On the distilled spirit side, it's much more limited. And there's very few states where distilleries can sell directly to consumers and then also ship that product to the consumers. And so what oftentimes happens is the brand will have a website where it says, you know, go to brandx.com. Buy now, you click buy now, but actually now it's taking you to a third party site, a marketing site that has relationships with retailers around the country. And mm -hmm. now the sale is actually going to that retailer and the retailer is accepting the money and then delivering to the person, you know, wherever the zip code of the person is. And, and hopefully they're following the rules regarding that. And so you want to have terms and conditions in your, um, on your website that outline like, hey, we're not a retailer, we're not selling an alcohol, we're just making these things available. So to answer your question, yes, um, you do wanna be mindful obviously of those things to protect yourself from not only the terms and conditions kind of legal side, but also privacy policy to make sure you're um, you know, storing and using the names of in, in personal information of the people in the way that um, you're allowed to. I, I regularly refer clients back to lawyers because of course I will never write a terms and condition or even suggest one online. I will always suggest with to go to a lawyer um, so they can make it specific to the company. So yeah. I imagine that for anything cannabis or anything uh, alcohol related, that would be very ideal to do as well, even if you have the product, to make sure that you have a lawyer that can help set that up so you don't get lawsuits at, um, directed at you. And can you talk about advertising? Like how can people advertise their product online? Can they 
Um, can they advertise on social media? Have you seen anything where that has happened, like uh, for cannabis or for alcohol? I mean, it's pretty common to advertise online, whether it's through spokespeople or hiring influencers or directly from the brand site and creating, um, you know, Instagram posts or whatever. Uh, so no, it, it's fine, of course, to at least in the alcohol side and, and by and large in the cannabis side as well, um, depending on the states. But there's typically no problem with the advertising as long as the advertising includes what we talked talked about earlier, which was the TTV mandatory, and then also doesn't have any. Um, you know, specific claims like health claims or there from the spirit side, there's the distilled spirits council of the U S the wine has wine Institute or there's, you know, um, beer has a similar organization and they have, um, a code of responsible advertising. And even if you're not a member of, let's say the distilled spirits council, you could be subject to a violation, which uh, just means that they would have, um, a com complaint review board process and you sort of like bad PR, like you're not, um, you know, being a good industry player kind of a thing, but you just want to be mindful of what that is just because it is kind of best practice to largely follow that, which is don't suggest overconsumption. Don't, you know, mark it with like Looney Tunes or Fruit Loops or something that's primarily appealing to kids, that sort of thing. So if you do make reasonable advertising, then um, and responsible advertising, then that is generally fine. What you do need to be mindful of though, is, and I see this happen quite a bit, is when you talk about specific places to go, right? So when you are an alcohol beverage company or brand, you're not supposed to, what they call give a thing of value to retailers. And that thing of value could be almost anything that's not specifically permissible oftentimes in the regulation. So, you know, giving them like a napkin caddy or bar mats and you know, inside signs are all usually fine. But when you start advertising for them and saying, hey, go over to this, you know, hotel bar, they have like the best cocktail of ours ever, check out the menu, that would generally be um, prohibited. But you can oftentimes say in most states, go to, you know, Joe's liquor store and Sarah's liquor store and naming two specific independent places, you know, two different stores that are not affiliated is usually fine. And you can also oftentimes pre-announce allowable tastings or allowable bar spins or other events. So you just need to be mindful because it is a little bit different state to state, but certainly there's a lot you can do online. Yeah, I guess what I was thinking about is like, I remember at one point when I was um, starting my makeup line and we use like alcohol uh like names, you know, like vermouth and things like that. And we got flagged because they thought we were selling alcohol on Facebook. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, yeah, we yeah, actually, sure. but we were actually selling, you know, makeup. So it was really interesting that, you know, I know that on Facebook and I guess I'm guessing Instagram as well, you can't directly um, market your products saying like, you know, here's my shop, go here. There are ways that you can do kind of passing through to the, you know, the website where you would go, or oftentimes people will drive people to like Drizzly or, or some other, you know, um, website where people can purchase products. So yeah, I mean, there, you definitely have to follow the, the policies of the channel or the, or the platform. And can you talk a little bit more about selling across different states? So as a brand, let's say you're based in Florida, and your product's sitting here and you're selling in Florida for years and no problems. And now you want to expand to, you know, Georgia or California or Texas or New York or whatever. You have to think about how you're going to get into those states. So after you find a distributor who's going to sell your products, because in the alcohol industry, um, but for exceptions, basically the producer sells to the wholesaler and the wholesaler sells to the retailer. It's the, the three-tier system, which people might have heard of. So now to sell to, let's say, California, you have to apply in California for a permit like oftentimes an out-of-state shipper's permit, they'll call it, um, or something quite similar, to authorize you to be able to sell to distributors in that state. Sometimes you need to provide labels and brand registration so that the state that you're selling to knows, okay, now we're selling this new product in the state. Here's the label. It was approved by the TTB, which is the federal government that's responsible for approving labels. And you know it's approved, so it's safe, et cetera. And now we're selling in your state and here's a distributor that's going to be selling it. So if there's ever an issue, the state knows, okay, well, I'm going to go to this distributor because 
this is the brand that they, you know, was registered them. And if there's an issue, we know where to go, which is um, largely the, the point of it, um, ideally. And so, yes, yeah, so you do need to be mindful of what you need to do in each new state to sell into it. The other thing to be mindful of is that when you go into new states, some states are called franchise states and some states are called control states and some states are called open states. So Florida and New York, California, those are open states where you just enter into a contract with your distributor and your relationship with the distributor is based on largely the contract. So you could terminate at any time or not. In a control state, it's where the government is responsible. So you need to be, you know, you're selling to, let's say, Pennsylvania. And then the hardest one to think about as a new brand are franchise states where it's very, very difficult to terminate the distributor because of state law. So sometimes people will be all excited to sell into a new state, um, I don't know, Tennessee or something like that. And then the distributors are like, oh, yeah, we don't use contracts except for the state form or, you know, New Jersey or something. And then you start selling and then it doesn't work out. You're like, oh, geez, well, I didn't know I was going to be stuck with you forever. And I don't even have a contract. It's all based on the state law. And it could be challenging if you're not aware of the states you're going into um, and mindful of like what the laws are in that state. And are there any other permits or licensing that um, brands might need to sell their products? Usually the brands would get a, at minimum, a federal basic wholesale permit and potentially an import permit if they're obviously importing product. And then they would oftentimes have a home state permit, right? Potentially an import permit or a wholesale permit in their, the state that they're basically based in for um, their operations. And then that would allow them to sell within that home state to other distributors or perhaps even to retailers, depending on the state. And then they would get the out-of-state shipper permit equivalent as necessary to sell into all of the other states. There are third-party compliance companies that kind of manage a lot of these permits if you need that sort of a, a service as well. And they provide a lot of back office support. So that's certainly an option. But if you were going to do it yourself, then yes, you would do it with getting all the different permits in all the different states. Um, it is, I mean, we do these all the time at our firm, but also um, certainly people can do it. And we have clients who do. It's just uh, one of those administrative, uh, administratively heavy tasks to manage all of those and when the renewals are and things like that. But certainly we we help people do it all the time. Great. And what is the most common mistake that you see um, alcohol entrepreneurs getting into legal trouble about? The one we talked about earlier is by far the most common, the distribution issues where they jumped into contracts with the distributors because they were so excited somebody was even going to take the product when they launched it. And then five years down the road, things are going really, really well. And now they're like, all right, well, now we're going to switch this other distributor and they're, they're just stuck and the distributor doesn't want to let them out. I would say that's probably the most common. And then the, the most common, mis not mistake, but thing that brands do that I would say is a little bit, you know, potentially problematic or gray is the posting about um, one place only. Like a lot of times people will be I'm at this bar and here's this great cocktail. And there's not often that much enforcement around those one-off issues, but um, you know, ideally people would be mindful of what the rules are around social media and advertising and supporting accounts in that way. Um, and we do a lot of training around that as well because you do wanna be mindful of um, those rules. And I also, in addition to my law firm, I'm also um, the, the founder of an app that's unrelated called Set the Bar. Uh, it's setthebarapp.com and we have it's all 50 state rules that include social media rules about what you, where you can post and has all of the, um, oh. the sort of the basics on state rules on advertising, inside signs, outside signs, like things you can give accounts, contest sweepstakes, et cetera, and a really easy to read, non lawyery like, you know, red, yellow, green type of a way for everybody to easily access that information. I, spent, I imagine it can get really uh, complicated for people when, especially if they're doing like influencer marketing and stuff like that. Like I imagine it'd be so easy for an influencer to do a paid ad and they're at some particular bar and they say exactly what you just said is actually an illegal element. Um, so it'd be so important to know that kind of stuff beforehand. Yeah, it's always helpful to kind of understand what your influencers are going to do because when you hire them, they're acting as an agent of the brand. So obviously it ends up being the brand's fault if they're doing things they're not supposed to do. So yeah, I mean, you obviously have to train them and make sure that, that you know what they're posting 
And how much should an alcohol entrepreneur budget for their legal counsel in the first year of business? Um, I would say it depends how much they, they're trying to get done. If it's just basic permits and kind of startup costs, it's not usually that bad. What ends up being more complicated is if they have a lot of corporate work. And so, for instance, if people are they have multiple partners and they're raising money from a multiple people, then it ends up being the, the corporate side ends up being much more expensive oftentimes than the kind of alcohol beverage side. So for instance, just getting basic permits um, that you need to operate in a couple of distribution contracts or co-packing agreements, you know, trademarks, things like that. I would even think like 10 or 15,000. And then the corporate side, I oftentimes see being the more, um, the more costly. It, it just depends on how kind of complicated the, the structure of that company is and whether or not you have celebrities involved and how many different people and different investors. So that side ends up being more expensive than kind of the very specific alcohol beverage side, I would say. That makes sense. And can you talk to us about um, like that label that goes on to the alcohol? Like what kinds of things need to be on the label? And do you provide um, review for label compliance? We do. So there's two pieces of it. Some products need what they call a formula approval. And TTB's website has a great um, tool where you can type in, it's like your drop downs against it's domestic product, foreign product. Um, what is it? And then it will tell you if a formula approval is required. So for instance, like a straight vodka wouldn't need a formula approval. You just go right to labeling. So other products that might have more complicated flavors like RTDs and things like that would have a formula approval requirement. So you would get that first. We review it and help you know help you through that process. And then the label approval side, you would have to have certainly your brand name. You have to have the um, the net contents, the ABV, the statement where you know the imported statement or the bottle by statement, uh, the government warning, and the statement of composition or the class and type. So you know vodka, gin, vodka with natural flavors, etc. The labels and formulas have to be submitted by either the importer or the bottler so or the or the producer depending on you know the scenario so we oftentimes help and do a first pass or we oftentimes will work for the bottler and do it for them and their their kind of contract clients or for the importer and so we do that but it, sometimes it's out of our hands if you're co-packing with someone and they have you know counsel that does it all the time for them then that's okay too of course is there anything else that we didn't ask you that is pertinent information about um, starting an alcohol brand? Well, the one thing that comes up often is the contract with the person bottling it, because a lot of times brands don't want to start their own distillery. I mean, sometimes they do, of course, but a lot of times they want to just start co-packing and make sure things are going well and kind of um, a test case to make sure that maybe they will down the road to start their own distillery or maybe not. Um, and that agreement with the co-packer is pretty important. There are or can be issues, right? So for instance, if I ordered the cans for my spirit-based RTD product and you're the co-packer, but you didn't check them when they arrived and then you filled it and then the can liner wasn't there perhaps, or maybe it was, they were broken or, or something, then who is responsible for that? Is it me because I ordered them? Is it you because you filled it and didn't check it? Or the can company for sending maybe cans that were all defective and exploded or something? So it's important to understand in the contract with the co-packer, who is responsible for what and what happens if things don't go well? Like what if I told you it needed to be done by X date and I was, gonna, you know, so I could hit OND or something? then you weren't able to meet the deadline. It's like, okay, well now what? And so I think you need to just think through all of these contingencies because I see them <laughs> all the time and they could be crazy scenarios, but you need to think through them before you go into that contract with the co-factor to make sure you're covering like every contingency you can think of to the best of your ability. And then hope that the one thing you didn't think of is captured in some of the language you, you came up with. So it sounds like from the very beginning, people people should come to you for helping them figure out next steps before they actually sign on the dotted line. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly a, a lawyer familiar with the alcohol beverage industry, we're, we're um, you know, always yeah. happy to help, of course. And 
Um, if we uh, are not able to, certainly we know um, people in a lot of different states that would uh, would likely be able to help as well. But I would definitely always suggest people hire a competent and a lawyer that can help them with um, this, this specific industry because it's, it's definitely very nuanced. Thank you so much for being here today. And uh, we'll see you guys on another episode of Entrepreneur Mind Speak. Bye. Thank Bye. You.